side. We'll follow the order of service and prayer and preaching as you find it printed in your service folder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to the to, to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him himself himself and take up his, his cross, cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. <coughs> salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The Lord break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And in his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will see. <coughs> Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Passion reading this evening is recorded by the Evangelist Luke in chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, 
We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he heard that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see Jesus. For from what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. And he said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. <coughs> I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But the loud shouts, or with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released to the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they had asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. This evening, on our look at the Catechism, we focus upon the second petition of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself with our prayer. But we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. How does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. We continue with our theme hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. It is number 436.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, our crucified but also risen Savior and King, let's be honest. The world around us is a complicated place that can be hard to figure out. Life sometimes sends us a fair amount of suffering and pain. When you look around, it's not hard to spot injustice and cruelty. Whether you've come through a lot or been spared a little, we all know this. It's nothing new. It's been this way since Genesis chapter 3, and it certainly is this way now. Sometimes Christians talk as if the world isn't a complicated place, as if they sort of have things all figured out. Little sayings are shared, and people often mean well. The sayings may have some truth, but they tend to make things way simpler than they really are. For example, I believe in the power of prayer. Well, there's truth in this, of course, but what about the prayers to which God says no? Or what about those prayers that seem to go unanswered? Have you ever experienced this? It is complicated, and we don't know all we'd like to know about how it all fits together. Here's another one. When God closes a door, he always opens a window. Again, it's a simple, hopeful thing to say, but it's not in the Bible. I think that I understand the good intent behind this, but it's, it doesn't acknowledge how complicated the world really is and how puzzling and how hard life can be for people, including us Christians. Even though God's ways are often hidden to us, still we believe God is at work in the midst of the suffering. We pray with faith because of the kind of God we have come to know. Even with the evil around us, we trust God is at work against the evil, in spite of the evil, and even uses the evil for his purposes. Is this a blind sort of faith? It's a pretty tall order, actually, to ask people to believe in such a God. The question is, why do we? A full answer would be a whole nother sermon series. But in a very beautiful way, Luke chapter 23 gives us an answer, our reason for believing. What happens when the leaders of Israel lead Jesus to stand before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea and Samaria? The short answer is evil, real evil, coming against the only man ever to live of whom it could be said, he didn't deserve this. Yet, all this evil was taken up and used by the living God for good, for my good, for yours, for the good of the whole world. This is why we can live as we do here in a broken world, in faith and in hope. Let's look at the three major players in our reading tonight. First, the chief priests. We met them last week. Their evil is the blind ignorance of unbelief. They hate Jesus. They claim Jesus' authority as God's, or Jesus claims authority as God's son, as, as the king, and he rejects the way that they think about their God and one another. He shuts down all comparison, 
teaching the only way to know the true God is in complete humility, looking only to him. For this reason and others, the chief priests speak with one voice. Now they lead Jesus to Pilate and accuse him of crimes against Roman order and justice. They want Pilate to believe Jesus is guilty, and they want Pilate to execute Jesus. But it doesn't work. They can't convince Pilate. When Pilate sends Jesus to Herod Antipas, the governor and ruler of, or the ruler of Galilee, the chief priests go along and they keep on accusing Jesus there, but it doesn't work there either. They can't convince Herod that Jesus deserves to die. Herod wants to instead have some entertainment. So we have this going on. After being before Pilate, then, or before the uh, before Herod, he comes back again to Pilate, and they keep demanding Jesus' death. We would rather have that murderer Barabbas than this Jesus. Does this convince Pilate to change his mind? No. He knows Jesus doesn't deserve to die, but the voices of the chief priests continue. They intended for evil. They're sincere, at least some of them, and they keep pressing for what's wrong, the blind ignorance of unbelief, the evil in this world. There's another evil in our reading, but sometimes we might be tempted to downplay it. It's in the second major player in our text, and that is Pontius Pilate. He's the governor of Judah and Samaria. <coughs> Pilate represents the interests of the Roman Empire. The top two interests are order and peace and tax money. Pilate has made mistakes. He's learned the hard way how strong Jewish convictions are about religious things. In matters of capital crimes, Herod holds all the cards. Rome will not let local leaders execute someone, even if they think this person deserves to die. Pilate must authorize the execution. With a poor, non-Roman citizen like Jesus, Pilate is the prosecuting attorney, defense attorney, judge, and jury. He can call for witnesses or not. Her Her or Pilate holds all the cards. The chief priests get his attention by accusing Jesus of disturbing the peace, disrupting tax revenue, and claiming to be a king. This last one is the most important charge, and so Herod asks point blank, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus gives the same sort of indirect response that he had given to the Sanhedrin. It is as you say. Pilate interprets this to say Jesus is saying no. And so he says, I find no basis for a charge against this man. If the world were a just and honest place, if powerful politicians always did what is right, this would have sealed things, but it doesn't, they don't, and it doesn't. Pilate moves toward committing a great, great evil. When he hears Jesus is from Galilee, he decides to involve Herod Antipas. Herod isn't convinced by the high priest's accusations. When he learns about Jesus, he wants to see Jesus as a form of entertainment. He wants to see a miracle. But when just Jesus doesn't speak a word, 
Pilate mocks him, beats him, and sends him back to Pilate. Where does the evil stand now? Where it was before. Pilate knows, and he knows, Herod knows. Jesus doesn't deserve to die. But the priests gather all their voices and forces and demand crucifixion. Finally, Pilate plays the cards that only he holds, the authority that only he can exercise. He consents to Jesus being crucified. Now here's where we might shrug our shoulders and say, oh well, what did you expect? Isn't that the way politics works? Powerful people do what's convenient. They compromise their influence by special interests. Ruling authorities have been established by God and exist to protect the weak and the helpless, the widow and the orphans. God has given government the responsibility of rewarding those who do right and punishing those who do wrong. Pilate is no exception. Just because we've come to expect so little of officials in our day doesn't let Pilate off the hook. He, or his choice to send an innocent man the innocent man, to death by crucifixion, as every great and evil as those screaming voices of Jesus' enemies. Rulers are supposed to protect the innocent. There's no doubt Pilate knows Jesus doesn't deserve to die. What an evil thing Luke describes. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. What kind of a world is that? The same kind of world we have today. The evil of stubborn, blind resistance to God's chosen one. The evil of the powerful people who know what's right and, for whatever reason, choose not to do it. Sins of commission and sins of omission. It was their world, it's ours also. Shortly after Jesus' ascension, Peter and John are arrested for preaching in Jesus' name. When they're released, they go to their friends and report what the chief priests and the elders said to them. When they hear this, they declare to God, Sovereign Lord, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, did whatever your hand and your plan had predetermined for them. Was it evil? Did the power, the power players do evil? Absolutely. Was God caught off guard? Not in the least. He had planned it all in advance. Did God take the evil and use it for good? Most certainly. That's the sort of God we have. For along with the chief priests and Pilate, the other major player is Jesus. He doesn't look like the Lord here. The true king seems like anything but a king at this point. He looks like a pawn. The power brokers moving him here and there. He speaks to Pilate once, but otherwise he's silent before the powers of evil. But that's because God doesn't plan to stop the evil. God will take it and use it. Jesus is the true king. A true king represents his people. In the ancient world, it was understood that the king sums up his people, all right there in his own person. So, he is the people. 
And what happens to the king also happens to the people. Now, who could have understood this while it was all happening? God took the evil people were doing and deserved and brought it all against the king, against Jesus. God's plan wasn't to stop the world from acting. Jesus knew this and he let it happen to himself. Jesus took it so that he could lead it away. The chief priests had their way. Pilate did the deed. The evil was strong, and they went with Jesus there into his tomb. But God is stronger still, and Jesus rose from the dead, leaving the evil behind. This is how the world is, right? Well, Jesus has reversed how the world is. He has risen from the dead. He is victorious. He started a new world, and you and I are a part of this new world because of our baptism into Jesus. We cling to our king. Jesus is our king. He takes the evil and works it for good. Yes, our world's a complicated place. There's a lot of pain and a lot of confusion. Much of the time, it's probably best for us to just say two things. The first, I don't really understand how this all fits together, but I'll be here with you as we go through it. The other thing we can say and believe our God is still at work, and he knows how to take that evil and use it for good. It's not a blind faith. The proof of it, simply put, is Jesus. God worked good from evil and for us and for all people of the world. God still does this today for all those people who belong to Jesus, the King. Amen. Now may the peace of our God that passes beyond our understanding guard and protect our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our hymn of response is Jesus, Lord, or Lord Jesus Christ, my life. This is found in the Lutheran hymnal, and it is number 148.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift, the divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather, for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in need, for the hungry and homeless, especially those of Ukraine, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and dying, for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and for all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear us as we pray in Jesus' name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins, where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. And I speak to God. The Almighty and merciful God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. We conclude the hymn, For Jesus Christ My Life, we'll sing the last four stanzas. Mm -hmm. 